athletics yeah. enter into the presence of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, Jesus. Mm. God is so... This is what I want you to realize. He's so real. He's not a theory. He's not, you know, some great philosophy. He is, he's a father who loves his children that when we come in his name, we just reach out to him. He's there and he's, he wants to just be with us. So just that is why we're here. That is what you're feeling. God wants to fellowship with us. You may not be able to see him, but he's not far away. He's as close as just to mention his name. What's his name? Amen. Amen, Lord. We're going to go, um, let's do this right now. We're going to go Psalm 78, 40, verses 40 through 43. Um, I feel like I've really got a word from the Lord for you today. And uh, so, Lord, just help me to give it the way you want it given. Psalm 78, verse 40. How often they provoked him, meaning the Lord, and meaning Israel provoked him, in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God, and hear this, and limited the Holy One of Israel. How did they do that? Verse 42. They did not remember his power. And when and, and the day when he redeemed them from their enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zion. I want you just to take a minute before we start. And I want you just to think for just a moment. Think about something. God has done, a miracle that he's done in your life, somewhere, some ways, because all of the things that, that have preceded your life to this moment have brought you here right now. And so just pick one. And if you're new to, to Jesus, think about something he did that maybe saved your life or something else you know, but just take a minute and just think about something God's done for you. Go ahead and just think on that for a second. And just thank him for it after you have that. Amen. You see, God is always at work. Even when it doesn't look like he is. So many times we go through life and we're seeing all these things that are just seeming, it's minute after minute, it's second after second, it's hour after hour, and, and we, we're just seeing time progress. And so many times you might be at school or at work or somewhere else, you're just waiting for the day to end. And, and we don't understand the way that God is working. We need to take an understanding of that because it's as you look at your life and as you look at what God has done to bring you here right now that you can begin to, to grab a hold of understanding the promise that's in the moment. Because every moment with God is pregnant with possibility. God can come in right now for anybody who needs a miracle in the house. God can break in in a moment and you can receive it. It's it's not a hard thing for God. It's, it's something that, that we are always on the edge of something amazing happening. Yeah. It's like, you ever see, you know, The Incredibles? <laughs> In The Incredibles, Mr. Incredible, he's, a, he's this huge dude, right? He gets out of his car one day and, and he's so frustrated that he like grabs the car really harshly and he leaves dents where his fingers were. He picks it up and there's this little kid on the other side of the car. And he's not supposed to, and this is a secret identity, he doesn't, can't let the world know he's Mr. Incredible. So he, he sees the kid sitting there with his eyes open, his mouth gaping, and Mr. Incredible just puts the car back down and goes inside. And later in the movie, 
later in the movie, Mr. Crow gets out of the car again, and the little kid's there. And he said, kid, what are you waiting for? He says, something amazing. Yeah. <laughs> if we can begin to understand who's in the room with us, you can be sitting there with your eyes wide open, your mouth gaping, and, and the Lord can say, my son, my daughter, what are you waiting for? I don't know, something incredible. Something amazing. Because that's what he does. How about do that just for a minute? Just ask him for something incredible. Ask him for something amazing. <laughs> I thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus. So for those of us who are reading the Bible through, I tend to this is just to understand my pattern of life. I, I tend to be a sprinter. Um, I was teasing this morning um, with Ross, and I said, I said, I can't drum this slow. I'm a fast twitch guy. I'm just, I'm, I move fast. And, and so I do this with the Bible, too. I, I'll dash. I'll read, like, four days. And then, like, I take a couple days off somehow. Just, and not that I'm not reading my Bible, but I'm not reading the program, you know what I'm saying? I'm not checking my boxes on my little sheet. So, I, uh, I'm, in a, I'm a little ahead of what the schedule says, I think. But, um, I'm reading right now about Israel is about to step into promised land. God had promised his people a location where he would dwell with them. And they would have dominion. That they would establish his kingdom in the earth there. And he is bringing them to this point. And, and God has done all of these amazing things. There's, there's all these, you, you know the history about, about Moses in Egypt. How Moses goes and tells Pharaoh, you know, let my people go. And, and, um, and Pharaoh resists for ten plagues. And on the tenth one is the Passover. And finally, Israel is released from their slavery. And they go through Red Seas, and they, they go to the mountain, and then God gives them the law. All these incredible things happen. There's all these, you know, God showing up there. There's lightning and thunders and cloud. And it's an awesome experience. And in the midst of that, crazy stuff happens. Today I want to ask us right now, what are you worshiping? Now, I know that probably you're going, Pastor, by the way, if you don't know who I am, then I'm, I'm David Ayer, I'm the pastor of this church, by the way. My wife wants me to tell you about my show. It says, uh, you're soy. <laughs> and that means that means that I I am just a vessel. I'm, I talked about in uh, when I was in Nicaragua about how how when God moves. Now I want you to this is actually it's good because I, I thought you were throwing me off, but you're fine. Um, <laughs> when you get in the presence of the Lord and God starts to move, you know we we can right now see miracles. We can right now see breakthroughs. It's not hard for God. It's, it's about openness for us. And, and for those of us who, who minister and are used to this, and maybe you're supposed to minister today because we're all, as children of God, we are all ministers. We're all priests of the Most High. Um, that too, we're a two that God flows through. His Spirit flows through us to minister to other people. That's, that's what the worship band was doing. We're just, we're just a vessel to move through. And, and it's not the vessel. You never, you never when, when you're at the house and you get water out of the sink and you turn on the faucet and the water comes out, you don't go, what an amazing faucet. <laughs> you don't go, oh my gosh, did you see the talent that that tube had to bring the water from the well? to the spigot here. 
it's never, it's never the, the vessel that brought it. It's always the water. And, and in, in, in Nicaragua, they really caught this, and so they produced shirts. No soy. So now I will fully unveil the t-shirt. <laughs> See, but it's important that we, we understand who it is we're involved with and, and, and what it is that God wants to do. God is always, he's always, hear me on this, he's always water for the thirsty. He's always healing for the sick. He's always going to be the ray of sunshine for the person who feels like they're living under a cloud of depression. That is always who he is. That's, that's who God is. He, he cannot change who he is. That's his nature. He is love. He is pure. He is holy. He does just care for his children. And the reality is this. If we are open to allow God to be able to move and minister, he can do anything. That's why I love to see us worshiping in the front like this. And, and because what it does is it allows for us, we're, we're saying, you know what so many of these people up here are doing? They're coming up here because they want to touch him. And they're, they're, they're putting themselves in a position to receive from him. And, and we all need to put ourselves in that position. Because then God can move. And it's when we, when we don't do that, it's when we put ourselves in other positions, away from his presence, away from his flow, that we can begin to put other things up as many gods. That can be a lot of things. That can be your job. That can be success. That could be, you know, your sport. That could be... Um, your family. That could be a lot of different things. But, but the question is this. And is what are you worshiping? Because we can worship our sources of provision. We can worship our job. We can worship really in reality we are always worshiping some source of provision to us. And the things that we worship here beyond this because this is the foundation of everything. Whatever you worship that is not the Lord will always follow you. The things that you allow in your life, the things that, that you worship that are not Jesus, they will follow you. The things that you don't defeat, hear this, will always enter the next generation of your family. What's scary is they only get bigger. But I want to tell you something. This week, this week, we are going to break some of that junk off. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because God, God wants you free. He wants your family free. He wants your children free. He wants your grandchildren free. There was a, there was a post I put on. And sometimes Facebook is just funny because you can put something out there and you're thinking and and that you never say otherwise. And I was on my 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 uh, my page, and I posted on there my that my wife and do, uh, my wife and I have fought devils and defeated devils in our lives that have allowed for the Lord to begin to bless our daughters in a way that they're entering into now. But we had to fight that battle so that they didn't have to. And so many times, we as parents, we would, if we, if we knew what it was that we needed to fight, we would do that because these are our babies, right? I mean, we're, gonna, we're not going to just allow for someone to come and abuse our child. That is not going to happen. But the problem is, too many times, we don't understand what it is that we're fighting. So I want to help you a little bit today. Because, as I've said previously, the obstacle for God in our lives is always in us. 
It's interesting, isn't it, that God made everything. He made everything. I mean, he made everything in creation until he made man. And after that, he involved man in the process. He, he has Adam named the animals. He has, has Adam to be the one who's got dominion. And so in his putting man in earth and making him his child, he stopped having the freedom to not involve the man. That'll mess with some of your theologies, but I'm right anyway. <laughs> because God, God meant us to be part of the process. And when we, when we hold on to things, when we refuse to allow him to just flow, when we refuse to not just allow for, for his presence just to break out, then all of a sudden he can't break out as much. That's why I'm so proud of you guys these last four weeks. You've stepped into a flow. Do you feel the difference here? Do you notice how different it is right now than it was in the beginning of February? The reason is not because I'm preaching that. I know you thought it was. I'm not. It's because you're, you've stepped into the flow with me. You're giving God permission to move you and then to, to move with him into new places. And so what I would tell you is this. For everybody that's in the room right now or anybody who's watching online, whatever God's doing, get into the flow of it and go. Because there's nothing harder than swimming upstream. But you can, honey, if you want to. So the obstacle is in us. And there are two kinds of obstacles. The first is fear. The second is generational curses. But I'm going to deal with the second first and the first second. Hope you don't mind. So I want you to understand some things. Generational curses are kind of like family sins. Has anybody ever heard, this is a real statistic, that if your grandparents were alcoholics, that your parents had a certain percentage of likelihood to be alcoholics, then, you're, then that generation had a certain percentage of likelihood. And, and it's, it's, it can be tracked that very often alcoholism or any sin can have a root and it just keeps on going down the line. Anyone ever see that? Yeah. I don't care if you've read the stats, you've seen this. You've seen it live down in front of you, right? The reality is this, that is a generational curse. And a really easy Bible example of that is actually uh, in the golden calf incident in Exodus 32. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to read um, 32, Exodus 32, 1 through 4 out of the New King James Version. It says, now when the people saw Moses the lame coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. He's been gone for 40 days, you understand, on top of the mountain, talking to God who just happens to be showing up on the top of the mountain. Verse 2, and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from the hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molten calf. And they said, check this out, then they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, now, please understand that God has already shown up to them. God has, has moved at this point, chapter 32, God has already spoken out of the cloud. Would you be just in awe if like this morning the Lord's presence, his glory shows up in the middle of the room? And like, he speaks to you out of the cloud, would you be smoked? Yes. I would, I would, I'll tell you what, I'll be back next week. <laughs> because, because that's what they had happened. They, they, they heard God's voice. 
And they was crazy is they told Moses to go to the mountain and to let us know what God said. They were so freaked out that they wanted him to go and get the word from the Lord on his own. <laughs> They're like, if anyone's going to die, Moses, it be you. You go. Let us know what the Lord says. But yet, when Moses goes and he does that, when Moses goes and communes with the Lord and, and he's talking to him and giving him the law that we have in the Old Testament, um, they grow impatient. And they go to Aaron, his brother, and say, we don't know what happened to this Moses guy. He's God. We don't know. Make us gods. And so he shakes the golden calf. And they worship it. And from there, some of you will know the story. I don't have time to too much to get into it. But it is the first time since leaving Egypt that the people of Israel are blatantly in a doubt. See, but the thing is this, the things that you worship, and again, you need to hear me on this, the things that you worship outside of God will always follow you and will follow your family. What's crazy is that, that God is, is, is someone who always wants communion with you, but, but as we begin to focus on other things that are not Him, as we begin to look at other things that are not our source and deify those things and make them many gods in our lives, it detracts from who He is and it, it causes us not to see Him clearly anymore. Where maybe, see, understand that He's showing up at the top of the mountain, but when you've got your golden calf here, it's hard to lift your eyes. It's hard to remember that he is there and not here. And so many times we look at things as, as, as we may not even think that they're gods to us, but are we worshiping them is the question. Because the things that we worship are idols to us, and they don't leave on their own. In fact, like I said, they, they will follow you and they only get bigger. Check this out. I know that everybody in this room, if you've been ever in Sunday school, you knew about the golden calf. Anyone in here, did you know about the golden calf? Just give me a quick hand raise. Colin knew about it. the golden calf. There's tons of hands around the room, right? So, so the golden calf's a common story, but I want you to go with me. So we're going to 1 Kings chapter 12. And verse 26. Now Jeroboam is going to be talking here. And Jeroboam at that time is the king over Israel. He is the one who is, um, he's the king over the northern tribes. The nation has split because of Solomon's sin. And, and we have a southern kingdom of Judah. And we have a northern kingdom of Israel. And God had told Jeroboam that he was going to be king of the northern tribes. That he was going to separate, create two separate kingdoms. And that Jeroboam, who was running for his life, he's an away in a foreign country. And God speaks to him and says, you're going to be the king over the northern tribes of Israel. How many of you know that you know that God called you that, right? If God spoke it. Sent a prophet to tell you. There's a lot of security in that. But I want you to look at something. 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart. Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. Which is the house of David was the kings of the southern kingdom. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, little L, meaning their king. Rehoboam, the king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Verse 28, check this out. Therefore the king asked advice. It says, make two calves of gold and say to the people, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. 
Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Does that sound at all familiar? You see, what was one calf in the wilderness became two calves in the divided kingdom. What is bad in the beginning only grows bigger and worse over time. The things that, that we are, are going to put our source on, the things that we're going to label as our source, as our idol, as the things that we, we feel like are the, the things that add to our lives, those things that are not God become anchor points that continue to hold us back. You see, those, those idols haven't shown up for about 500 years. Isn't that crazy? Took a long sight to see Avis. But the problem is, those things still remained. And it just grew bigger. This is what a generational curse looks like. I want you to understand that Satan always wants your worship. He always wants your worship. He doesn't necessarily need for you to be bowing down to him. He just needs you to bow down to anything that's not Jesus. And that can be so many things, guys. And, and so many of those things don't look bad on the surface. It can be our career. It can be our success. It can be all of these things. And whatever it is, though, is the thing that you bow the knee to. So think about that for just a moment. Because this message today... I want us to be able to pull these things down. I want you to be free. And more than that even, I want your kids free. I want your grandkids free. I want you to be able to walk and be able to go up to them and say, you know what, you're never going to have to struggle with that. I have to struggle with that all the way up until this day. And on that day, that thing died and, and you don't have to deal with that anymore. So how do we do this? I want, first of all, I want to tell you how strongholds get built, okay? This might help you. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a stronghold uh, that was in my life from very early on till, till just really, probably, I mean, the way I got this message is God going, see how this happened and see how that happened and see how this ended up here. Just so you know, like, every time you get preached at, that message has been preached to me first, just so you understand I am not immune, nor am I better than you. We're just on this journey, and I'm going to hear, I'm here right now to help you get some clarity. So how does a stronghold get built? So first off, the stronghold that, that was in me um, was when I was, when I was young, I used to get attention from being sick. And you'll never, is anyone, like your mother, just my mom. So she's like two foot six, but she's she she loves hard. She's really five foot even. She sticks her hair up real good. She might be five and a quarter. <laughs> she's a tiny little Mexican thing, but she she loves so hard. She, you know, and if I'm sick, it was like, oh mijo, are you okay, baby? And she come, she hugged me, and oh, and, and I was like, just. <laughs> In my happy place, right? And she, she, oh, baby, go back to bed, and I'll bring you some, you know, hot chocolate later, and and uh, you know, she, she make the abuela uh, hot chocolate, which is my favorite thing ever. And all you white folks don't know anything about that. <laughs> if you ever, you can, you can cheat though. You can cheat and go get some good, good, uh, like Land of Lakes. I don't know if they had the Land of Lakes milk around. But it would, they did. It would be the best. It's from Ben's farm. But um, get some, get some good whole milk and get some abuela um, hot chocolate mix. It's these these discs, and they'll dissolve in the milk, and then you'll drink it. And you'll be really, you're gonna thank me later. But anyway, so these are the things. These are the things that would happen. And what what happened in my life 
was that at, a, at an early age, I realized that to one degree or another, being sick got me treated really good. So I want you to see how this works. This is the way that strongholds get built. First of all, something happens that you like. There's something about it that you like. You might not like all of it, but there's something about it that you like. If you don't like a lot of it, you must really like the parts you like. You follow me? So I didn't really like being sick, but I liked how I got treated. So it wasn't like a huge like, but it was enough. So, so you have an aspect of it that you really like, and it's reinforced. There, there's this part that, that, that happens, and it gets reinforced. It's like, oh, I do like that. And all of a sudden, it goes to the step two. It gets validated by an outside source. So I find out that, that when I'm sick, I get treated really good by my mom. And, and then I find out, as I get a little older and I find out some science, I, I learn, I wouldn't have been able to term this, but I learn a certain amount of virology, and I find out that people get sick. And there's, and there's a, you know, y'all are sick folks. I mean, there's somebody in here that's got something that's contagious right now. And, and so you get in contact, and, you know, poor Jamie Fitch, I mean, she's a teacher. She's got like a hundred, like, Factories of sickness that run around her all day as a teacher, right? So, so we have, we have, we understand that that there's this thing called viruses and, and that people get sick. So, so all of a sudden now it's been affirmed that I, I, I might get sick. I, uh, and when I get sick, I might get treated good. So it's not so bad to be sick. And, and then, so it's validated from an outside outside source. And then we accept it, hear this, we accept it as fact. We accept these things as fact. You now, hear this, you now have faith for it. Oh, I'm just, there, there, this, is, this is a real story. By the way, after marrying Denise, all of the pity for sickness went away. <laughs> She's like, whatever dude, get up. <laughs> see, but, so I get over that, that stronghold real quick. But see, this is what, what was interesting about this to me this week is that I realized, I realized that, that my predisposition toward kind of getting attention as a kid being sick and then the validation of science saying that, you know, you're going to get sick, it, it all set me up to a place where um, I have to be aware of my mindset. Because I can enter into a place that I just start expecting to one degree or another to get sick. Oh, God, we all got sick and Mariah got sick. Oh, well, guess who's going to get And the, the problem with that, and I know I'm using a very basic thing. You see, all of these decisions, all of these things that I decided have been made outside of the council of what God says. We never asked, I never asked, what does God say about it? When I find those answers, you go to Deuteronomy 7.15, it says, the Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. And when you realize that, well, all of a sudden, like, for anyone who didn't know, I'm, I'm after church on Sunday, I started getting a cough. Monday night, I, I had a cough. Tuesday, I was going to go see the Duke game at Pitt because Coach K is my all-time favorite basketball coach. And, um, and they were like four hours away. I was like, I, and I looked, and you get tickets for like 50 bucks. I'm like, what? Who is not making more money than this? And so I was going to go, but Tuesday, I was a mess. And I'm coughing, and I'm all, I'm all a mess, and, and I don't go to the two game. You knew I was not feeling good then. Right, Pat? To not go to the two game, I gotta be your dad. So, um, 
But see, this is the thing. I, I was reading in my scriptures and I read this. And I go, you know what? I've accepted that I'm sick. I've allowed it to run its course in my body. And so now I start breaking it. And see, so many times, I know I'm using sickness as an example. And I'm not against medicine. I have good friends who are doctors. I think you should go get your checkup. By the way, did anyone hear about Jonathan Suber? Jonathan Suber, who preached for us a year ago, um, God just God just healed him miraculously. They said in Jan or they said in, in this November that they didn't know how long he was going to live. He went and got a checkup last week, and they said that his heart is functioning completely normally. Where it was functioning under 20% before in November, when he went back, it was tested at about 50%. And 50% is normal. So, so please understand, I am for medicine. I think medicine is great. But, but again, we can be for medicine, but it wasn't medicine that healed Jonathan Suber. It was Jesus. And too many times, we sit here in our lives and we have these strongholds, and it may not be sickness for you. It may be something else. It may be something that your parents handed down to you. But the end result is that we put our faith in something as fact rather than what God said. And, and when we do that, hear this, it gains power over us. It gains power over us. We come to submit to what we think is true. And there are times that, that we are dealing with realities that may not be good. There have been times when we got a report from our brother Jonathan about his heart functioning at below 20%. That report was not good. That report was found scientifically to test. That was the reality he was facing, but I want you to hear me. His reality was not greater than God's truth. And when we understand that the things that limit us, the things that are trying to hold us back, when we understand that our faith, if our faith has been put in our diagnosis, if our faith has been put in, in, in something other than what the Lord says over us, we give that power over what God's word says. It creates a false God. How do I know that? And I know that this, you guys are like, what? How does that make it a, faith, a false God? Because you have faith in it. And you're submitting to it. Because that's what you do with God. You have faith in Him. You submit to Him. So when we put other things on these thrones in our lives, what happens is we empower them. We empower them. A little easier maybe example would be for all of our high school kids. Maybe you're a great student, maybe you're a great athlete, maybe you're just super cute. And all the boys go, oh, actually boys go, whoa. <laughs> and the girls, you know, if it's a handsome boy, they're like, oh my goodness, we're so down. <laughs> right? And then the problem is this, you, you get, you understand that you like it, an aspect of it, then it's reinforced from the outside, it's validated from the outside. Maybe you're getting written up in the newspaper. I used to love, I would buy the newspaper just to find my name and cut it out. Oh, David Irving, 128 yards this week and had three touchdowns. Oh yeah, that was getting flipped out. <laughs> you know? You start getting you start getting known outside, you start going places. I would go places and people would go like, you're David Aaron, you're captain of the football team. Yep. And I get free stuff and I get all special treatment. All those things are validating from the outside that this is my thing, this is my purpose, this is what I'm made for. We accept it as truth, and this is the thing. We end up accepting that that's our identity. 
we accept that that's our identity. And all of a sudden, we are believing in something that's not really who we are. You see, all of these strongholds, and I'm picking out just a couple that people could maybe relate to, but this is a real thing. That's why, that's why right now, right now, if you went to the local bar, there's somebody sitting at a bar right now talking about the good old days. Oh, remember? You know, oh yeah, John was a great quarterback. He threw for 398 yards and five touchdowns. Oh yeah. And say, hey, John, oh yeah, remember that game? Oh yeah. And you live, you live by these moments that, that, that used to be, and it's because of the identity that you had when you were there. But what about now? All of these things create obstacles. This is the point of it all. This is the point of these things, these, these illustrations, is we create obstacles that we never get past. Those are the strongholds that control our lives. We need to understand that those are the most benign. Those are the nice ones. I gave you two nice ones to think about. I didn't talk about alcohol and drugs and sex addiction. I didn't talk about pornography and incest, and all the other junk that follows our family lines. The reality of life is you trace it back far enough. You go to your family, even those of us who are saved, I'm telling you right now, my family, my Baptist family, my mother's family, faithful Baptist folks, but you know that my mom, and there was of, of 11 children, my mother and two others are the only ones who never got pregnant or had a child outside of wedlock. That's a problem. That's a generational curse. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And the reality is all of these things, the, the reason I gave you these nice little candy stick illustrations is so you can understand that you, you like part of it. And it gets validated from the outside and it becomes part of your identity. And when it becomes part of your identity, you don't believe you can have anything else out of life than this. But I want to tell you something. No matter where you come from, no matter what your life looks like, no matter what you come out of, the reality is this, you're part of a new family now. You have a new father. You are part of the redeemed. You have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He said that all things, all things were passed away. Behold, all things will become new. The reality is this. Your past can de cannot dictate your future. And there's people in this room that your life has been limited by what used to be. The things that used to identify you. Oh, you're just like your mother. Oh, you're just like your father. Oh, you're going to be X, Y, and Z. And all of a sudden you start living up to the expectations that have been put on you. But I want to tell you something new. I want to tell you that you're not limited by those old words. I want to tell you there's a new word over you. God's got a word over your life. And he wants you to become the man, the woman that you are called to be. We have got to stop accepting things as fact that are put on us. But we have to choose that. If you are a slave to it, then you are identified by it in your heart. If it controls you, that's how you know you're a slave. But I want to tell you today, you've got the keys. Jesus said that he came and gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever he would loose would be loosed. And whatever he would bind would be bound. And right now, right now in this room, whatever it is that's holding on to you, you've got the key. You've got the key right now 
to be able to set yourself free. But you've got to understand and believe that you own it. For as long as you have the key, but don't believe you do, you can't go anywhere. It's like when Denise and I were locked out of my car after I came back from Nicaragua. You guys heard the story. Freezing to death. Terrible. My, my fob's not working on my, on my, it's out of battery. And I'm trying to get in my car. You know what the worst part of it was? I knew I could pop the, the, the key out and pop a part of my door off and stick the key in and get into the car. But I was thinking, that doesn't do me any good. I'll just be cold in the car. Well then, as, as, as I find out later, if you take that file and you put it by the ignition switch, there is just enough juice in the microchip that it'll start your car. I'm like, that's great. Now. <laughs> I had the key to be able to open the door and to go, but I didn't know that I did. And right now, in this room, are people who've been dealing with generational curses. You've been dealing with false identity. You've been dealing with a, a skewed concept of who you are and what God has for you. And, and you've had the key. You just didn't know. So right now, I want to deal with the second obstacle. Because the second obstacle is what keeps you in the first. Because the generational curses is, is the, the thing that holds you back, but the thing that stops you from igniting the engine and moving from away from that place is fear. You see, fear, Fear is related to the instability that's going to be created when you let go of what you used to worship. There are people that are in this room, I was one of them back in the day, when I, I would look at a certain area of my life and, and I knew God was working on it. He wanted me to submit it to him and I would be like, I don't even know who I'd be without that. I don't even know who I'd be. Because it was just such a part of my family line. It was such a part of who I was. I didn't know who David and I was without that problem. Can anybody relate? So many times we, we're sitting there and we, we, we might even believe that we've got the key, but we're scared of what it looks like. I remember when my wife was at her church where she grew up in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Elam Tabernacle on 60th Street in Greenfield. There was a woman who came to church every week. She was deaf. And then she was raised in church and there became a great passion for her and the, the people in the church wanted to make sure that she understood the word of God. Is that a good thing? Amen, that's a good thing. So they, we had a little team of people who learned sign language. And every service, they'd have someone and she'd be sitting right here. And she'd have her person in front of her signing the, the message for her. It was awesome. And then one day, an evangelist came, who was my mentor, Eli Hernandez. And God started moving powerfully in the service. And God moved on to her. And she stood up. And Eli went and prayed for her. And God instantly healed her. She actually, she had hearing aids in, she screamed, she threw them out of her ears because they were, it was so loud. Because her hearing had been healed. And she, she's sitting there and she's rejoicing the Lord at first. She's, she's so excited. But in about five minutes, you can see the wheels turn. And five minutes after that, she put her hearing aids back in. Because, because she had identified herself with her disability. 
She started asking the question, well, uh, what's going to happen now? I mean, I won't have this person who's translating the service for me. I will, I will not get all the attention I used to get. I, I will not, well, I'll just be this normal person. And suddenly the fear of her freedom overcame the victory of the moment. And there's people in this room that are like that. It might not be that you're getting any attention for it. Or you could be just like me as a little kid getting sick and mama taking care of you. But see, the thing is this. So many times we hold on to these things in our life because we don't know who we'd be without it. We, we would feel so insecure. We don't even understand it. See, but you don't understand what God wants to bring you on, onto the other side of it. He doesn't he doesn't just want to leave you there. He wants to bring you now into the purposes he's really got for you. Not to be limited by some other thing, but to be catapulted into his presence. Catapulted into the creative purpose he's got for you. Where you would end up, and I can speak from experience, is way better than where you were when you were holding on to it. See, Jeroboam was like that. Jeroboam, the king, he feared losing his crown. He feared what he would lose. And what I want to just tell you today, what I want to tell you today, is what you would lose is nothing compared to what you would gain. The things that we hold on to, the generational curses, the things that we've identified ourselves by that are, that are limiters of who we are and limit our identity as children of God, all of those things that hold us back, they only hold you back. They are not good for you. They are just things that limit God's glory out of you. And if you would just understand that you've got the key, then you can get free. And you don't need a 12-step program. You just need Jesus. Just for the record, and I, we have 12-step programs that work out here. And I'm for them. Bill Matthews has, does a great job with a Christian 12-step program. But the thing that we do not do is you do not stand up and say, Hi, I'm Bob. I'm an alcoholic. Because that shows where you've identified yourself. I want you to hear me right now. If anybody's struggling right now, in fact, stand up. <coughs> if anybody, and probably, this is probably everybody. Because again, just so you understand, God talked to me this week about all this stuff because I still had a soft spot in my, in my heart about being sick. I still felt like I just got, you know, even Liz, Liz Deegan, who always takes care of me and makes me grateful. Thank you, Liz, for always doing that. But she was like, when I, on Monday night, she's like, oh, poor pastor. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Somebody needs to pray for him. Yes, please. <laughs> See, old strongholds, and I didn't even recognize it as a stronghold until this week. And it's a little one, but it limits me. We need to, right now, just ask the Lord, what areas in my life right now, Lord, are limited by strongholds? What, what things have I built in my mind that I believe that are less than what you believe about me? What things do, do I have that are crutches or have caused me to limp that would you want me to run and I've got the key and didn't know it before today? Right now, I want you just to pray about it. Think about it for just a minute. Father, just bring revelation. Bring revelation in Jesus' name to your people. As God speaks to you, just, just, just come. Just come. Just come as, a, as stepping out. Come as stepping out of that past and stepping into a new future because you've got the key and you're getting free today.
This is what we're going to do. Come on, you can keep coming. For those of you who are here right now. And just so you know, I know it's more than just my leaders who are struggling. Thank you for having the humility to admit that there's things in our lives that are not lining up to God's word. I just want you to just begin to pull those things down and give them to the Lord. Repentance means to turn away from, so turn away from every fear. Turn away from every fear. Turn away from every idol. Turn away from everything that separates you from God. Repent of those things. Just repent of them. Just repent of them. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we just give you these things. We give you these things right now. Lord, we repent of the things that we've identified ourselves by that are not of you. We repent of, Lord, the idols, big or small, that we've allowed to 